What's going on guys? Welcome back to Weekly GCAP, the only source you'll ever need to catch up on all the gaming news from the last week. This week, uh, yeah, we got a lot of spicy stories for you guys, so we're just gonna dive straight into this. First things first, if you guys remember last week, we talked about Nintendo releasing their first $70 game, that being Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. They gave a very brief response to this, and I'll just read the quote directly. The spokesperson said, and I quote, No, we determine the suggested retail price for any Nintendo product on a case-by-case -case basis. A end quote. That, that was all they had to say. So now, I just have to wonder, what is going to be considered worth $70, whereas what will be considered only worth $50, $60? Because obviously, we look at Zelda, that's going to be $70, whereas something like Metroid Prime Remaster that just came out a bit ago, while sure, it was only a remaster, I would argue that that game looks 10 times better than Zelda does in terms of graphical fidelity, and yet, that game only costed $40. Now, obviously, graphics aren't the only determining factor as to how much a game is going to cost, because again, Metroid Prime was just a remaster of a game from the GameCube era, but I feel like it's still a fair question. Maybe it's going to be based off of the budget for these games, because I'm sure Zelda costed quite a bit to get made when you think of the soundtrack, voice actors, on top of all the developers required to make a game of this size and scale. Because let's not kid ourselves, Zelda, in terms of all the Nintendo IPs, is definitely one of the more ambitious ones, and definitely one of the bigger ones that they make nowadays. You gotta think about how much goes into that, like a massive open world, all the different story beats and quests that you have throughout the game. There's a lot that goes into it, and I'm sure that those games are far from cheap to make. So after a quick Google search, we can find out that Zelda Breath of the Wild costed $120 million to produce. And when you consider that that was a game made for the Wii U, yeah, it's safe to say that Tears of the Kingdom costed a bit more. So I'm not exactly sure what they mean when they say it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, I'm not sure anybody does considering how vague that statement is, but we'll have to keep our eyes peeled and see what their reasonings and standards are for pricing games going forward. Next up, this one isn't too long of a story. I just found it kind of funny. The top sellers last week for Steam Global Globally, meaning across the entire world. Let me read you the top four spots. Hogwarts Legacy Digital Deluxe. Hogwarts Legacy. Hogwarts Legacy. Hogwarts Legacy Digital Deluxe. Yes, you heard that correctly. Hogwarts Legacy took up all four of the top slots for Steve's global sales last week. Honestly, I'm really glad that this happened. The whole boycott and controversy that was surrounding this game before its launch and is still surrounding it after launch. It's absolutely stupid. It's ridiculous. Play whatever games you enjoy. Do not let any idiots on the internet influence your decisions as to whether you do or do not purchase just a game, just buy the game and have fun. This is like the second time in one year, isn't it? I remember back when Bayonetta 3 was coming out and there was a whole boycott situation going on there. The game actually ended up selling better than any other game in that series up to that point. So it just goes to show these no life freaks on the internet trying to boycott everything are doing nothing but hurting themselves. As I can tell you right now, I surely don't care. All of you guys watching shouldn't care either. I think we ought to just let all those weirdos do their own little thing in their corner of Twitter, Reddit, and YouTube. Next up, before we get into the headlining stories for this episode, I like to go over the upcoming PS Plus slash Xbox Game Pass games whenever the time comes. And for this month, it's a pretty solid lineup for PS Plus Extra and Premium. This may be the best month that they have had for both Extra and Premium to this point. So let's just go ahead and rattle off the games that are coming to PS Plus Extra on the 19th of February. Those being Horizon Forbidden West, The Quarry, Resident Evil 7 Biohazard, Outriders, Scarlet Nexus, Borderlands 3, Tekken 7, Ace Combat 7, Skies Unknown, Earth Defense Force 5, Oninaki, Lost Sphere, I Am Setsuna, and The Forgotten City. Can we talk about how crazy that lineup is? And let's go back to the first one that I mentioned, Horizon Forbidden West. That game came out only a year ago, and it's already getting put into the PS Plus Extra category. Personally, I have yet to buy and complete Horizon Forbidden West. I did play a little bit of it because they had a trial available through PS Plus Premium, but the fact that it's already coming to PS Plus Extra is absolutely awesome, and I'm sure that it's going to help this game get the recognition that it totally deserves. The Horizon games have had a bad track record in terms of when they decide to release, so the first one came out right around the time that Breath of the Wild was coming out, and then guess what happened last year? They released the second one around the same time that Elden Ring came out. Yeah, that Elden Ring, the game of the year Elden Ring. I don't know what's up with them and scheduling these Horizon games to come out at the worst times. Maybe it's so then they have an excuse when they talk to their investors about how the game was doing, like, hey, the game didn't sell so well, but look, Elden Ring game of the year was coming out around the same time. You can't blame us for that one. At least that's my theory on it. And plus, Horizon Zero Dawn actually ended up selling quite well. So I'm not too sure why Sony felt the need to release Horizon Forbidden West around the same time as Elden Ring. Because again, the only reason that I can think that they would want to do that is so then they can have an excuse when they go to talk to their investors about maybe if the game wouldn't have sold so well, they could point to Elden Ring and be like, look, that game was coming out around the same time, so ours just didn't sell as well. Again, I'm just kind of spitballing here. I don't know if that's actually the case. I just, I hope for Horizon 3, they actually release it at a better time. I mean, last year, Horizon ended up coming in at number nine on the best-selling games of the year. So at least 
least it still did well. I just feel like it could have done even better if they chose a better time to release it. Next up, let's cover the PS Plus Premium games. There's only four of these, but for what they are, they're pretty good. So first up, we got The Legend of Dragoon for PS1 coming to PS Plus Premium. This game is so underrated and so overlooked, and I am so glad that a whole new generation of kids are going to be able to experience this game through PS Plus Premium. I remember absolutely adoring this game back in the day, and it's still one that I replay often. I still have my physical copy of this game. I mean, granted, you have to sort through like four discs every time that you try to play the game through to completion. Actually, it might have been six discs. I'm having trouble remembering because it was that many discs. But still, it'll be nice to just have it all in one tight-knit, cohesive experience there on PS Plus Premium. In fact, when it drops, I'm going to be going ahead and playing it that way so then, you know, I don't have to switch discs every couple hours. I cannot recommend this one enough. If you have not played it before, please give it a shot. But then after that, we have Wild Arms 2, Harvest Moon Back to Nature, and Destroy All Humans, the PS4 remake. The fact that they keep including PS4 remakes as part of PS Plus Premium and trying to act like that adds value to the subscription, I just... It doesn't count. Sure, it's a remake of a PS2 game, and therefore, it's technically a classic game, but it, it's not the same thing. PS Plus Premium is definitely lacking on the PS2 games. I hope that they fix that soon. But regardless, if you haven't played Destroy All Humans before, whether you haven't played the remake or if you haven't played the original, I definitely recommend giving this one a shot. And heck, even if you have played it, it's worth a replay. It's a really good game. Now, on to the headlining stories for the week. I am so excited to get into this next one. After 10 plus years, Dead Island 2 has gone gold and not only has it gone gold it is going to be releasing early originally it was slated for april 28th 2023 but they bumped the release date back a week and it will be releasing on april 21st 2023 i am literally so giddy even talking about this right now i used to love dead island one i spent so many sleepless nights playing with my friends online playing by myself blasting through the story getting all the cool modifications for your weapon setting zombies on fire electrocuting them it was just it was truly something else anyway they made a post over on their twitter they said, you asked for it, you got it. Dead Island 2 went gold and it's coming out a week early. See you in hell a on April 21st, 2023 with a picture under it just saying Dead Island 2 is finally gold. Now the headline in the title that said 10 year old game goes gold, I'm not exactly sure how accurate that is because you got to remember this game was first announced in 2014, right? Which means we can presume that the original draft of Dead Island 2 went into development. Oh, I don't know. Maybe in 2012 or 2013 because the original Dead Island came out in September of 2011. Unless this was a situation, which this is actually quite common in the games industry, but a lot of developers will actually start planning or full on developing a sequel while they're still putting the final touches on the first game, whether that be the same development team or maybe they have a B team that starts it. Not every game dev does this, but some do. So if that was the case, and that means that this game has been in development for even more than 10 years and has been in development since 2011, or it's possible that they didn't start development until after Dead Island 1's release, which would mean that they started around 2012 to 2013, which at that point would mean that this game is officially 10 years old. Regardless, this game has been in development for about a decade now. It's switched developer hands many times. The fact that this game is even going to be coming out it's, it's a miracle. It's honestly a miracle. However, if you guys are aware of other games that have been through similar development cycles, say like, oh, I don't know, Duke Nukem Forever, we know how these games could possibly turn out. I'm not saying Dead Island 2 is gonna come out like that, but I'm definitely staying cautiously optimistic on this one, just considering how much turmoil has been involved with creating this game behind the scenes. Again, I'm not saying the game is gonna be bad, and I hope that it's not bad. I've been waiting for this game for over a decade at this point, but as everyone should be with modern releases, honestly, I'm just gonna be cautiously optimistic optimistic, but that doesn't change the fact that I'm really hyped for this game, man. I'm just gonna wait for the game to release and the reviews to go up, and as long as it isn't like a broken buggy mess like Cyberpunk back at launch or the Xbox One and PS4, then I'll definitely be picking it up. Do so you guys know how in basically every single weekly GCAP episode I say, yeah, we'll probably be talking about Microsoft and the whole Activision acquisition in a week or two? It's been a week and we're here talking about it again. In fact, I saved these last four stories for last because I didn't want to bog anybody down with this. I know there are people that are genuinely sick of hearing about it. So if you happen to be one of those people, you're free to click off the video at this point. The rest of this video is going to be Microsoft, Sony, Activision acquisition, drama, and news. But for those of you that are sticking around, oh my gosh, we have a lot to go through. And I, when I say a lot, I mean I am staring at a full two pages of stuff to go through. We're just going to dive straight into this and we're going to try to get through this as fast as possible. So first up, Game Pass is hurting Microsoft sales according to CMA assessment. Now, there wasn't much of this document that was actually available to read. Most of it was redacted. But from what parts of the document were actually publicly available to read, yeah, apparently Game Pass is hurting Microsoft's bottom line when it comes to their revenue, which honestly, hearing that doesn't surprise me. I remember it was only a 
a year or two ago that I believe Microsoft had actually come out and said something along those lines of how Game Pass actually hasn't become profitable for them yet. However, I feel like that may actually change this year. You got to think about how much they have up the pipeline. Starfield, Redfall, the new Forza Motorsport game. Furthermore, if you go back about a week or two, we were actually talking on the show about how the Coalition is working on the next Gears of War game, and obviously Gears of War still has a huge following to this day. And while obviously the new Gears of War isn't coming out this year or even next year, I mean, that's another big IP that's uh, down the pipeline for them at the very least to consider. The way I see it with their lineup of games for 2023, if this year doesn't get them enough users or revenue to make Game Pass profitable... I don't know what it's going to take at that point. There is a wide array of games and genres coming out onto Game Pass this year, along with more and more systems being sold. So if this year isn't enough for Game Pass to actually start becoming profitable for Microsoft, I wonder what the future of the service is going to look like. I'm not saying it would necessarily disappear by any means, but could it go up in price? Could they maybe do an adjustment to their service somehow? I'm definitely interested to see what this looks like. Because you also got to remember, out of any of the subscription services of any of the big three console manufacturers, Microsoft's is the most expensive. Game Pass, the only way that you can pay for it is $180 a year because they do not have an annual plan. You have to pay $15 a month individually, and if you do the math, that's $180 a year. Next cheapest to that would be PlayStation. PlayStation Plus Premium only costs $120 a year, and then Nintendo's, you can get it for as cheap as $20 a year or $50 a year with the expansion pack. And with some other stories that we have coming up soon, if the Activision acquisition ends up going through, well, there's going to be a lot of value added to Game Pass. And if not even those games are enough to bring in enough users to make Game Pass profitable, then I really wonder what it's going to take or what's going to have to change for it to be worthwhile to Microsoft. I mean, again, at this point, Microsoft is so rich that throwing out $70 billion to acquire Activision really isn't a big deal to them but you know still eventually i guarantee they're gonna look to make some changes so they can actually profit off of it long term all right we'll take off the tinfoil hats for a second here because microsoft actually did end up giving a quote-unquote official response to it it's not really a response it's more just pr speak than anything so the microsoft spokesperson said and i quote xbox game pass offers gamers and game creators more choice and opportunity in how they discover experience and deliver games for gamers that means providing another option for them to discover games and play with their friends at a great value for developers that means creating Creating another option for how they monetize their games. We're focused on helping game creators of all sizes maximize the total financial value they receive through Game Pass. Each game is unique, so we work closely with creators to build a custom program to reflect what they need, ensure they are compensated financially for their participation in the service, and allow room for creativity and innovation. As a result, the number of developers interested in working with Game Pass continues to grow. End quote. And uh, yeah, it was basically just as I said. It was it was a whole lot of PR speak with a, some semblance of an answer buried in there somewhere. Basically, when you dig past all the fancy PR speak, what they're really saying is, yeah, that's absolutely right, but there's more people interested in working with Game Pass, so we should be making some money soon. While we're talking about the CMA, I got a headline for you. Analysts see CMA objection to Activision Blizzard acquisition as a signed deal will go through. If you guys remember last week, obviously a lot of drama got started between the CMA and Microsoft. The CMA was throwing around a lot of accusations along with some quote-unquote solutions, such as selling off Call of Duty or selling off one of either the Activision or Blizzard branches, so then they'd approve the deal to go through. Well, like the headline said that I just read to you, yeah, analysts have been looking into it and they think that this deal will go through. They're so confident in it, in fact, that they think that the deal will go through by mid-May. If you guys remember the original targeted date that they were looking to close this deal by, that being Microsoft and Activision, they were looking to close this by June of 2023, but if they could close it by mid-May of this year, that would definitely be something that I, I think me and many other people wouldn't have seen coming, but something tells me that there's going to be another wrench thrown in this at some point. Like, at this point, most most of the regulators around the globe have approved this deal or the ones that have tried to throw out accusations or have tried to get this deal shut down. Well, most of those were taken to court and most of those accusations were subsequently shut down. So who knows, this could actually end up going through by mid-May. Or like I said, another wrench could end up being thrown into this by one of the regulators around the world or by some other company. And we'll be talking about this for another year yet. I hope that's not the case. I want this deal to get wrapped up, but with the way things have been going, I'm staying cautiously optimistic. I really want this deal to go through. It's gonna do nothing but benefit the consumers in the end. And again, the only way that this deal would not benefit consumers in any way is if Microsoft would make Call of Duty an exclusive, but with the amount of money that Call of Duty makes over on PlayStation, I really don't see it being a smart business move for them to just yank Call of Duty away from PlayStation, and if they end up doing that, 
Well, then I I'll eat my words. I'll admit that I was wrong. But they did keep their promise with other games like Minecraft. And you gotta remember, Minecraft is the best-selling game of all time at this point. And they kept their promise, and they have allowed that game to remain on Nintendo and Sony consoles without any restrictions, without exclusivity of any kind. So I honestly do believe Microsoft when they say that they would allow Call of Duty to remain on all the other systems. Especially considering the fact they already signed that deal with Nintendo, saying that Nintendo could release a Call of Duty on their system if they wanted to after the deal goes through. Alright, we won't linger on that any longer because we still have a good bit to go, so we're gonna try to pick up the pace here towards the end. Alright, so for the next headline, Sony claims Microsoft is harassing them. I'm just gonna read this quote from the article directly. Sony has accused Microsoft of obvious harassment as the battle for Activision Blizzard heated up this week. Microsoft wanted to see files on Sony executives. Oh, by the way, this goes back to the story from two weeks ago where Microsoft was looking to subpoena Sony. Basically, if you don't know what a subpoena is, it's just the legal way for Microsoft to be able to see some of the behind-the-scenes stuff over at Sony in terms of their numbers and other dealings and such. Going back to the article now, Microsoft wanted to see files on Sony executives, including performance reviews as part of the discovery phase of this particularly bitter legal battle with the FTC over Microsoft's proposed $69 billion buyout of Activision Blizzard. In a motion to the court, Sony issued strong words of response. Microsoft's demand for performance reviews for SIEs, which stands for Sony Interactive Entertainment's leadership is obvious harassment. Sony continued, even in employment cases, courts require a specific showing of relevance before requiring production of personnel files. This is not an employment case. So there's a lot more to go through, but I'll just, I'll stop for a minute so everybody can kind of process what was just read. That, I, I like... Sony accusing Microsoft of harassment. Do we want to take a minute to acknowledge the fact that Jim Ryan has been doing nothing but harassing Microsoft and Phil Spencer this entire time publicly? And while sure, subpoena is kind of a more dirty, behind-the-scenes way of Microsoft being able to get a behind-the-scenes look of things over at Sony, I don't know, man. I think I'd rather deal with the subpoena behind the scenes rather than have my competitor talk smack about me on multiple articles and news outlets online every other week. Because like I said, if you want to talk about harassment, I can pull up all of Jim Ryan's quotes from the last here if you like. All right, has everybody had enough time to process that? All right, sweet. Let's move on to the next bit of the story. Perhaps more interesting is Kodak's allegation that not only Sony stopped talking to Microsoft, but that it has also stopped talking to him. And this is coming from Kodak directly, quote, suddenly Sony's entire leadership team stopped talking to anyone at Microsoft, Kodak told the FT. The FT then includes this line following the quote, adding that his own calls to Sony's chief and other executives were not returned. Kodak goes on to say, I think this is all Sony just trying to sabotage the transaction. The whole idea that we are not going to support PlayStation or that Microsoft would not support the PlayStation, it is absurd. Now, that really shocked me because you have to remember, Sony is still in cahoots with Activision. Do you want to know who has the marketing rights to Call of Duty right now? PlayStation. Do you know who publishes Call of Duty? Activision. Do you know what game makes the most money for Sony every single year? Call of Duty. Are you seeing why my brain is so jumbled just reading this right now? I could obviously understand if Sony didn't want to talk to Microsoft with everything that's been going on publicly lately, but Sony not talking to Activision. I guess Sony is just really backing down and not wanting to have anything to do with either of the companies following this transaction. I mean, again, I really don't know how smart that is considering the game that makes Sony the most money every single year on their platform, that being Call of Duty, is published by Activision, which if Activision ends up getting bought up by Microsoft, is it really a good idea to have bad blood with not only your competitor, but your number one moneymaker that is also then owned by your competitor. I'm not necessarily saying that Microsoft would then use that bad blood to spite Sony in some way and yank Call of Duty from them, but if the heads of Sony really want to continue to be childish and push buttons like this, who knows what could happen? Say what you will about Bobby Kotick, but in this instance, he is absolutely 100% correct, and nobody can deny that. The line where he says, I think this is all Sony just trying to sabotage a transaction. I mean, I think we all know that at this point, obviously, Sony's trying to sabotage it why wouldn't they? It's just the extent that they've gone to to try to sabotage it that is just, it's honestly getting ridiculous. Things have just been progressively ramping up over the last year that this deal has been going on and all the things behind the scenes have been going on and now it's getting to the point where Sony isn't even wanting to talk to either Microsoft or Activision. I'm getting the feeling that the latter half of this acquisition drama might get a little interesting. This is the last bit of news which is also kind of technically tied to this story. This coming from Reuters saying Microsoft will make a last ditch effort to defend its $69 billion bid for Call of Duty maker Activision Blizzard in front of the EU and national antitrust officials at a closed hearing on February 21st. The company asked for the hearing after receiving a statement of objections from the European Commission warning about the possible anti-competitive effects of the deal. Now, obviously, this is a closed hearing, so there's not much that we're going to know about it until after the fact. But this makes me really curious. Who all is going to be at that closed hearing? I mean, it could be possible that there could be some representatives from Sony there at that hearing to fight back against this deal, especially considering they're the number one company and organization that's been fighting back against this deal harder than literally anybody. 
buddy. At this point, we really don't know anything about it. So for me to continue talking about it really would just be tinfoil hat theories. And I don't want to waste anybody's time. This video has been long enough as is. This hearing is happening this coming Tuesday on the 21st. So just know that if any details are released to the public in any capacity, we will most certainly be covering it in the next weekly GCAP. It's entirely possible that there's going to be a bit of a delay between the time that the hearing actually takes place and before any documents or statements are made publicly available. But just know that whether it's next week, the week after that, or a month from now, as soon as we know any information on it, I will definitely let you guys know immediately because, you know, I've been a little tired about covering this story just because of how redundant it's been feeling, but things are really ramping up and it actually has my interest, if I'm being honest. For a solid eight or nine months, it was really just Jim Ryan and Phil Spencer are going back and forth talking smack publicly but now things are really spicing up it's getting taken to the courtroom there's different hearings taking place there's a bunch of global organizations getting involved and all sticking their hands into this deal and taking it apart i mean obviously that's been happening the whole time but it's happening more so now than ever so with that being said and considering that we don't really have any more news surrounding this topic at the moment we'll just kind of have to leave this one off on a cliffhanger and pick up on this story as soon as we know more and there we have it ladies and gentlemen that is all the stories for weekly gcat this week i oh my gosh that was a lot i mean in terms of actual quantity of stories it was about the same as any other week but just considering the subject matter this was definitely one of the more spicy and intense episodes of weekly gcap i'm sorry if a lot of this video really was just speculation and tinfoil hat theories but considering the fact that there was only so much of these documents and statements that are made publicly available a lot of this really does come down to just tinfoil hat theories and speculation to kind of fill in the gaps, specifically when it comes to this whole acquisition drama. But now I want to hear from you guys. What are your thoughts going into the release of Dead Island 2? Have you gotten a chance to play Hogwarts Legacy? Are you looking forward to the PS Plus games coming up? Do you guys have any tinfoil hat theories or speculation regarding the Sony slash Xbox slash Activision drama that we covered this week? Whatever it is, I'd definitely love to hear from you guys. But like I said at the top of this video, this is Weekly GCAP, the only source you'll ever need to catch up on all the gaming news from the last week, even if most of the episode is just us talking about acquisition drama. I promise there will be more stories that we cover besides this, hopefully sooner than later. Anyway, I'll see you guys back here next Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Thank you guys for watching. Have an amazing day and an amazing weekend. Stay beautiful. I love you all. Peace.